Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome, welcome you to this afternoon's event in the Ford School Policy Talk series, Beyond Civil Rights, The Moynihan Report and Its Legacy. I'm Sandra Danziger, Professor of Social Work, Research Professor of Public Policy, and Director of the Interim Steering Committee of the National Poverty Center. On behalf of our center and the poverty research community here at U of M and Dean Susan Collins of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy, I want to welcome all of you here and all of, the, uh, and all of you who are also participating via live web stream and Twitter. And I, I've been asked to say, to, to ask you to please turn the sound off your cell phones if you haven't yet. So just about 50 years ago, in March 1965, this internal memo of 78 pages in length, written from the Labor Department to the LBJ administration, opened a Pandora's box and set off a firestorm that in some ways continues to this day. We'll learn a great deal this afternoon about how the Moynihan Report came about, uh, what Moynihan's intentions uh, were or might have been at the time, and what uh, this report has meant for domestic social policy and the social science and social policy research community ever since. So first, I want to go briefly over our format and, have, um, and hope that you refer to your program for further details and speaker bios. Hope everyone got one of these. Our featured speaker, Daniel Geary, will go first and talk about his forthcoming book. And then our discussants will follow, and our moderator will facilitate a brief dialogue between the speakers. Then, just after 5 p.m., we'll aim to open up for questions from the audience. Um, I'd like to remind you that if you have a question for our discussants, please write it on one of the cards passed out at the entrance, and Ford School volunteers will begin collecting question cards at around 4.40. Our students, Marin, Alemu, and Damar Lewis, who want to stand up, um, will, um, will collect your questions and ask questions. Um, and if you're watching online, you can submit via your question um, via Twitter using the hashtag policy talks. So I'll now turn uh, the podium over to Assistant Professor of Public Policy and Historian Joy Rohde, who will introduce the speakers. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Daniel Geary. He's the Mark Piggott Assistant Professor of US History at Trinity College, Dublin. And his work focuses on the intellectual and political history of the 20th century United States, particularly the mid-century United States. And we're here to hear about his new book, but I also want to recommend to you his first book, um, which is a wonderful biography of a very important sociologist. And that book is called Radical Ambition, C. Wright Mills, The Left and American Social Thought. And today we're going to hear about his new book, forthcoming in June from the University of Pennsylvania Press. And you, as I already have, can order it uh, ahead of time on Amazon. Uh, it's called Beyond Civil Rights, The Moynihan Report and Its Legacy. And it's a very sophisticated, and you'll see a very welcome study um, of the report and its long and varied impacts on how we talk about race in America, and particularly how we talk about race and inequality in policy contexts. Commenting after Professor Geary's uh, talk will be Anthony Chen, a political and historical sociologist from Northwestern University um, and a former colleague here at the Ford School, and we're very pleased to have Tony back with us today. He's the author of The Fifth Freedom, Jobs, Politics, and Civil Rights in the United States, which is a history of affirmative action in employment, and it's won more awards than I have time to tell you about right now. Um, he's currently working on a study of the emergence of affirmative action in colleges in the United States. Also commenting will be Matthew Alemu, who's pursuing a joint PhD in sociology and public policy here at the University of Michigan. And he's currently conducting um, very important and interesting research about how disadvantaged black men understand their lives in the face of stigma and social oppression. So I, I'll turn it over to Professor Geary. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. At a time when liberals and conservatives can't seem to agree on anything, they have joined together to celebrate the Moynihan Report, written exactly 50 years ago today, uh, or not today, but this, uh, uh, around this time. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan's The Negro Family famously argued 
that the, quote, unstable family structure of many African Americans, as reflected in female-headed families and out of wedlock births, would damage efforts to achieve full racial equality. Just last month, liberal pundit Nicholas Kristof and conservative columnist George Will uh, both wrote columns praising Moynihan's conclusion that bolstering two-parent homes is essential to fighting poverty. To be sure, Kristof and Will draw opposite policy conclusions from the Moynihan report. Kristof argues for programs to bolster two-parent families, while Will argues that government programs can only damage family structure. Nevertheless, both offer strikingly similar narratives of the controversy that surrounded the Moynihan report, that it was misunderstood and that Moynihan was unfairly attacked from the left as a racist. The title of Kristoff's uh, column, in fact, was When Liberals Blew It. Kristoff and Will, following in a tradition nearly as old as the report itself, misrepresent the history of the report, or the, of the report misrepresent the controversy over the report, and perpetuate a misguided approach to understanding and combating racial and class inequality. Remarkably, even 50 years after its publication, the Moynihan Report remains a Rorschach test, inviting viewers to see in it what they want, as well as a litmus test reflecting deep ideological cleavages. In my talk today, I want to explain how a single document can be praised by Kristoff and Will, and indeed by President Obama and Paul Ryan while nevertheless remaining anathema to many on the left. I will argue that the Moynihan Report controversy did not result from a misunderstanding of Moynihan's intentions, which is the most common current understanding of it, but rather uh, it resulted from the report's own inconsistencies and its embodiment of a series of contentious assumptions about race, gender, and the role of government. These assumptions came under intense challenge in the late 1960s and 1970s. The 1965 document officially titled The Negro Family, The Case for National Action is colloquially named after its author, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was then uh, an official in Lyndon Johnson's administration. Moynihan wrote at the dawn of a new era in American race relations. Key legislation in 1964 and 1965 had ended Jim Crow segregation, had given formal equality to African Americans, and had discredited overt arguments for white supremacy. Yet Moynihan's opening sentence warned, quote, the United States is approaching a new crisis in race relations. The crisis, Moynihan uh, wrote, resulted from African-American demands that went beyond civil rights to include economic equality. Moynihan was responding to civil rights leaders who had long advocated economic reforms designed to ensure a basic standard of living for all Americans. The 1963 March on Washington, after all, was a march for jobs and freedom. Yet Moynihan worried that achieving full racial equality would be hindered by what he viewed as the, quote, crumbling and, quote, deteriorating structure of many African-American families. Family structure stood at the heart of what Moynihan notoriously labeled a tangle of pathology, evident in high rates of juvenile delinquency, drug abuse, and poor educational achievement among African Americans. Moynihan's thesis produced conflicting notions about how to combat racial inequality. Focus on male unemployment's destructive effects on families indicated the need for an activist state to surpass the limited anti-poverty measures uh, enacted by Johnson during his war on poverty. In particular, Moynihan argued for full male employment and a guaranteed annual income. Moynihan later explained his strategy of appealing to family in order to win support from white Americans. Uh, this is a quote from Moynihan uh, later on. He said, quote, by couching the issue in terms of family, white America could be brought to see the tired old issues of employment, housing, and discrimination in terms of much greater urgency than they evoke on their own. However, Moynihan undermined his case for national action by treating family pathology not simply as an effect of economic inequality, but as the primary cause of what he saw as the inability of African Americans to compete with other groups. Moynihan asserted that family structure was the, quote, fundamental source of the weakness of the Negro community. 
He also speculated that poverty had become self-perpetuating. The situation, he wrote, may have begun to feed on itself. Well, if that were true, then African-American inequality was an intractable problem that could not be effectively addressed by government action. The report's ambiguity proved useful for Moynihan, who sought a claim across the political spectrum, and for the Johnson administration, which adopted the civil rights movement's rhetoric about economic inequality, but failed to endorse the necessary measures, such as the $100 billion freedom budget advocated by civil rights leaders. The report's central inconsistency, whether family instability was a symptom of broader inequality or its primary cause, also explains why for five decades it has been cited by liberals favoring national action, as well as by conservatives promoting racial self-help alone. After the report was released in August 1965, it won defenders as ideologically diverse as Martin Luther King and William Buckley. The report's ambiguity suggests that the controversy over it cannot be understood, as many scholars today argue, as a simple case of, quote, misunderstandings and misrepresentations, to quote historian James Patterson. Misrepresentations did feed the debate, as they do in any significant controversy, but they did not occur solely on one side. If opponents sometimes missed Moynihan's liberal intentions, he and his supporters often ignored the substance of their criticisms by reducing them to assertions that Moynihan was a racist, a charge that few critics actually made. In fact, it is strange to make Moynihan out as a victim of the controversy, a claim he and his supporters have re repeatedly put forth. For 50 years, the report has received overwhelmingly positive media coverage. Far from damaging Moynihan's career, the report launched him to a prominent professorship at Harvard University, to a top post in Richard Nixon's administration, and to a long career as a senator from the state of New York. Moynihan's report received such diverse and heated reactions, not only because of its own ambiguities, but also because it articulated assumptions widely shared among early 1960s liberals that came under intense challenge just around the time of the report's release. Most liberals in the early 1960s believed in the government's ability to alleviate economic inequality without reforming corporate capitalism, in the cultural assimilation of ethno-racial minorities, in the desirability of male-headed families, in the efficacy of social engineering by experts and government officials, and in the superiority of middle-class American values. And I'll go through a few of these. A document born of a liberal mindset that valued the perspective of trained elites. The, the Moynihan Report generated challenges to established experts' claims to understand African-American life. Black power advocates saw the Moynihan Report as a classic illustration of white domination of the study of African-Americans and representing the need for African-Americans to define themselves. The black sociology movement called for the, quote, death of white sociology. And it contended that Moynihan's depiction of African-American culture as pathological falsely presumed the superiority of middle-class white norms. In his 1968 book with the wonderful title, Look Out Whitey, Black Power's Gonna Get Your Mama, <laughs> Julius Lester uh, took aim at Moynihan in a chapter entitled Bang, bang, Mr. Moynihan. To Lester, Moynihan's pretension to racial expertise proved that whites thought, quote, they are greater authorities on blacks than blacks themselves. African Americans could not trust whites, Lester maintained, quote, until they stop going to the Daniel Moynihan's to learn about blacks, but come to the ghetto to learn for themselves. Moynihan assumed the natural superiority of two parent nuclear families headed by a male breadwinner. He saw the, quote, matriarchal structure of African American families as their chief weakness, and he explicitly supported taking jobs away from black men, uh, or taking jobs away from black women in order to give those jobs to black men. Moynihan complained that a program in his own government department had hired African American women instead of men. He observed, quote, you can stand in front of the Department of Labor any morning at 8.30, and it is a sight. Spectacularly well-dressed, competent, beautiful young black women spending the day on the phone with the Attorney General and seeing ambassadors, then coming home and asking the old man, what did you do today? And indeed, Moynihan was critical of government programs such as these. Uh, he's also critical of aid to families with dependent children or welfare, because he saw these programs as inverting power dynamics between men and women in African-American families. 
Moynihan's support for the male breadwinner family norm fit with a broader mid-century liberal tradition that emphasized the need for men to be paid family wages so that women could focus on taking care of children. Moynihan's patriarchal assumptions were not widely contested on the report's release in 1965, but by the late 1960s, debate about the report became explicitly as much about gender as it was about race. Second wave feminists challenged its patriarchal norms. Black feminists in particular were the report's most thoroughgoing critics. They charged that the report promoted racist stereotypes of black women as promiscuous and domineering. They targeted not only white liberals such as Moynihan, but also many uh, male black power radicals who even while contesting Moynihan's right to opine about African American life, often agreed with Moynihan on the need to restore black male authority in the family. One black fam feminist compared, quote, the brother nattering away about how we've been lopping, lopping his balls off so long, it's time to stand aside, with, quote, people like Moynihan carrying on about our matriarchy and urging black women to confine ourselves to standing behind the men of our families. For black feminists, pointing out that male black power radical, radicals' gender ideology was no different from Moynihan's uh, was a very effective argument. The combustibility of Moynihan's assumptions about race and gender was clearest in reactions to his report's most concrete policy for African American advancement. The report actually had few uh, direct policy suggestions. Its one main suggestion was this, uh, recruiting more black men into the military. Moynihan's proposal uh, fit a liberal strategy to provide jobs to bring up male breadwinners to stabilize African American families and communities. In fact, Moynihan understood that uh, recruiting more black men to the military could be done without legislative action, which was another uh, bonus. Uh, this proposal also reflected a belief that success in American society required middle class values presumed to be lacking among African Americans. In the Army, Moynihan alleged black men would learn discipline. The proposal also reflected Moynihan's belief that African, that African American men suffered from a matriarchal culture. The military would provide them with a, quote, utterly masculine world, a world away from women, a world run by strong men of unquestioned authority. Moynihan's suggestion, uh, advanced during the rapid escalation of the Vietnam War, met opposition from several fronts. Even though many black power advocates agreed with Moynihan's patriarchal ideals, they rejected military service as participation in an American imperialism that targeted non-whites abroad, just as it oppressed non-whites at home. Men involved in the anti-war and countercultural movements rejected Moynihan's equation of masculinity with submission to hierarchical discipline. And feminists viewed the plan as a brief for patriarchy. One feminist mocked Moynihan for assuming, quote, women are so terrible that it is a fantastic relief to get away from them. Never mind that the military service is experiencing explosive racial problems, it is still better than being around women. The Moynihan Report controversy proved especially significant for liberals. Attaining economic equality for African Americans, unlike securing legal and political rights, exposed the limits of post-war liberalism, divided liberals, and enabled challenges to liberalism to, to surface with a renewed intensity. The Moynihan Report controversy is sometimes mistakenly viewed as emblematic of a post-war liberal consensus that suddenly unraveled during the late 1960s. Yet far from a stable consensus, post-war liberalism itself contained diverse and conflicting strands. The report reflected these contradictions and typified a post-war liberal mindset that recognized structural economic barriers to African-American advancement and yet was committed to meritocratic notions that individuals and ethnic groups succeeded based on their ability to compete in an open marketplace. The race-based economic inequality that Moynihan identified was so entrenched in American society that readers of his report could include either the government needed to enact the kinds of radical reforms advocated by civil rights leaders, or the government was simply incapable of addressing the problem. The, re the report thus contained both the seeds of a left-wing challenge that deepened liberals' war on poverty and a neoconservative attack on the welfare state. Now, one way to track the controversy's impact on liberalism is to examine the trajectory of the report's author. In the late 1960s, Moynihan became one of the most prominent neoconservatives a set of post-war liberals who moved to the right. The report contained already a thread of neoconservatism and its suggestion that government might be unable to solve a problem rooted in family structure. 
Neoconservatives spun that into a blanket challenge to liberal social engineering. The controversy itself played a key role in pushing Moynihan and other neoconservatives to the right. Ultimately, Moynihan concluded that those who most forcefully called for racial equality, that is, radical African Americans and their allies, were responsible for the racial discord of the era. In a notorious 1970 memo to President Richard Nixon that was then later leaked to the press, uh, Moynihan uh, advised Nixon uh, to uh, carry out a policy of, quote, benign neglect uh, for discussing race. Nearly all interpretations in the Moynihan report surfaced by the mid-1970s, indicating the crucial long-term impact that this decade, the first decade after the 1964 Civil Rights Act, had on American racial discourse. The, nevertheless, the Moynihan experience, uh, report experienced a scholarly and media revival in the 1980s that has never fully dissipated. During the presidency of Ronald Reagan, the report was increasingly appropriated by conservatives. Drawing on neoconservative ideas but pushing them even further, Reaganite conservatives argued that liberal welfare policies, not racism, caused racial inequality. To William Bennett, for example, the lesson of the report was that, quote, the most serious problems afflicting our society today are manifestly moral, behavioral, and spiritual, and therefore remarkably resistant to government cures. At the same time, the report continued to hold appeal for liberals. Most notably, starting in the 1980s, the prominent sociologist William Julius Wilson revived the report's analysis of black social pathology to promote reforms to address race-based economic inequality. Wilson declared that he was, quote, following in the footsteps of Moynihan. And Wilson has been one of the report's staunchest supporters for the past 25 years. In my view, Wilson and other liberals have erred in hitching themselves to the Moynihan Report, a document that embodies not only the ambitions of, of 1960s liberalism, but also all of its shortcomings. At its best, the report called for national action to ensure social and economic equality for African Americans, not just the legal equality that had been ostensibly granted during the civil rights movement. But at its worst, the report conflated racial equality with patriarchy. It encouraged Americans to focus on African Americans' cultural traits rather than on political economy. Despite Moynihan's liberal intentions, it directed attention toward family structure as a primary cause of inequality instead of work, taxes, housing, and education. Racial and class inequality are again on the national agenda today, just as they were 50 years ago when Moynihan wrote The Negro Family. Yet an ambiguous and flawed government report written a half century ago is hardly a good starting place for discussing these issues in our own time. The uncritical commemoration of the Moynihan report by conservatives and many liberals threatens once again to distract from the real causes of inequities and injustices in American society. It is high time that we stop celebrating the Moynihan report. Thanks so much to Sandy for the invitation and to Cliff for organizing everything and to Joy for the flattering introduction. It's a real treat to participate in today's uh, conversation. Let me begin with a few words of praise for what Professor Geary has done. I think his work on the Moynihan Report is really important uh, and well done. It's an in yes, it's an incredibly nuanced and textured account. Yes, it's based on some incredible archival finds, but it's much more than that. At its core, what stands out to me about Professor Geary's book is that it's a corrective. It's a corrective in the sense that it fully historicizes intellectually and politically the Moynihan Report, maybe for the first time, despite all the writing that's been done on it over the years. In his hands, the report comes across convincingly as a document, as he says in his epilogue, that embodies not only the ambitions of 1960s liberalism, but also all of its shortcomings. What he's done, moreover, enables us to understand what otherwise seemed like irresolvable puzzles uh, or what other authors have had to sweep under the rug as inconvenient truths that uh, in order to maintain a semblance of a coherent take on the book, on the report. For instance, how is it that both MLK and Michael Harrington could have praised a document that was lambasted by some on the left as blaming the victim? And why is it that the report comes across more like a litmus test or a Rorschach test of political ideology than anything else? 
Professor Geary has arrived at a parsimonious interpretation that readily survives Occam's razor. The reason why the Moynihan Report has elicited such a heterogeneous and contradictory set of reactions, often among the same constituencies, and the reason why experience is recurring bouts of controversy over time is that it, it is a fundamentally ambiguous document that reflects the, quote, diverse and conflicting, unquote, strands uh, of post-war liberalism. That's a compelling way to think about the report, I think, and one that helps, to make us, uh, helps us to make good sense of what otherwise seems uh, incredibly confusing. So I'd also say that I think your book, uh, Professor Geary's book, also makes an important and significant historiographical contribution, and that is that it helps us to appreciate the significance of the 1970s for racial politics and racial discourse in the United States. There's a pretty big stream of work now that adds up to the argument that the world as we know it today, economically, socially, politically, intellectually, is a world that the 1970s gave us in one way or the other. Here I have in mind books like Niall Ferguson and Charles, Charles Mayer's Shock of the Global, Bruce uh, Shulman's The 70s, Jefferson Cowie's Staying Alive, and Judith Stein's Pivotal Decade. But nobody's really made the point about political discourse around racial inequality as sharply and carefully as Professor Geary has, at least to my, my knowledge, which is fallible. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's, uh, the book is fantastic in this regard. Um, and, and it appears uh, in moments when he writes, for instance, that nearly all interpretations of the reports uh, reports surfaced by the mid-1970s in indicating the crucial long-term impact of the decade after the 1964 Civil Rights Act uh, on American racial discourse. So that's an argument I think he successfully pulls off. Uh, the third thing I'd like to do, in addition to saying thanks uh, for inviting me out here, and I'll be sure to get uh, Dan Geary's book when it's released on July 7th, uh, is uh, I'd like to try to connect what Professor Geary has done um, with my own work on the history of race uh, conscious affirmative action policies in college admissions. I do think there might be a connection. I would love to try to suss out what it is. So with a co-author, Lisa Stolberg, I've been digging into the archival records of a number of colleges and universities, among them Michigan, Cornell, UCLA, Swarthmore, Wesleyan, and others, to try to understand where affirmative action came from. Dominant narrative is, as so far as there is one, is that affirmative action is a product of campus unrest, or the urban riots of the late 1960s. So what we found in the archival record in our research is evidence of a different story. At schools like Michigan, Cornell, and UCLA, we find that college administrators are adopting affirmative action as early as 1963 and 1964. Uh, men like Rogers Haynes and Harlan Hatcher at Michigan, James Perkins at Cornell, and Franklin Murphy at UCLA all led schools that observed an open door policy at mid-century and yet their campuses were nearly as lily white as Ole Miss. These men believed that their institutions could not stand apart from the tides of social change, and they were inspired by events of the early 1960s, Birmingham, March on Washington, to do something different. For them, even before LBJ enunciated it at Howard in 1965, freedom was not enough, and so they launched experimental admissions programs targeted at quote-unquote disadvantaged students, which included mainly but not exclusively African-American students. So these programs usually recruited uh, applicants from specially selected uh, local urban high schools that were known to be heavily minority in their population, and a light thumb was placed on the scale at the time of admission. So Lisa and I call this the first wave of affirmative action, and we've been sketching out the argument that the first wave is really a product of the racial, liberal, of the racial liberalism of white elites in the early to mid-1960s, and Professor Geary's work on the Moynihan Report offers a strong parallel and really helps us get a better feel for what we might mean. Moynihan's language reflected the conviction on the part of many racial liberals that a quote unquote new and special effort would be needed to address racial inequality. That quote, three centuries of sometimes unimaginable uh, treatment, unquote, meant that African Americans weren't simply quote unquote not equal to other groups in their quote, ability to win out in the competitions of American life. Those are quotes from the Moynihan report. And a different uh, approach was required in public policy. So now, have, having now read your work, it occurs to me that the, maybe a, the same strand of racial liberalism may have been behind the first wave of affirmative action. As U of M President Harlan Hatcher said to the U of M faculty in 1963, it was uh, about a, a initiative that eventually became affirmative action at Michigan. It was vitally important for the university to begin examining its, quote, practices with respects to students from deprived backgrounds. Their preparation does not permit them to be competitive initially 
but they do have the ability to work once the handicaps of poor training have been removed. So that's Harlan Hatcher in 1963. In much the same spirits, Jim Perkins of Cornell would say in later years, in a speech to the United Negro College Fund, the Brown case, as well as a, quote, rise of a visible concern for the equal treatment of minority groups at the beginning of this decade, jolted college leaders out of their uneasy slumber. Quote, our conscience stirred in its sleep. We dreamt that we were not doing what we should, and we woke to find that this was indeed so. A passive policy would only guarantee a continuation of de facto exclusion. And we correctly included that in order to increase the black student population, we would have to encourage black students to apply and re-examine SAT scores as predictive of academic performance for the disadvantage. So I guess I would want to know, I would put to Dan the question of whether he agrees uh, with our interpretive move uh, to sort of to, to say that affirmative action policies in the first wave are, motiva are, are sort of motivated or the impetus for it is this strand of racial liberalism that uh, maybe is the same strand that is behind uh, Daniel Port uh, by, behind the Moynihan report. Um, our evidence suggests that college leaders were closely attuned to uh, protests and demonstrations of the church-led Southern-based civil rights movement, which helped catalyze their belief that freedom is not enough. Um, where did this strand of, uh, uh, of racial liberalism come from on Moynihan's part? How is it that Mo Moynihan and other liberals who, uh, who uh, were part of this strand of racial liberalism became committed to the idea uh, that it was the role of public policy to uh, respond robustly uh, for inequalities that had accumulated over the flow of time. Uh, Professor Geary's uh, answer to this question, I think, holds great interest for anyone who wonders if a similar belief or conviction in the need for a robust approach to public policy is anywhere in the cards for us today. So. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to first thank Cliff, uh, Sandy, and Joy for inviting me to be part of such a, you know, accomplished uh, panel. Um, as a grad student, I don't often get a chance to, to speak in front of such nice decor. So it's nice to, uh, <laughs> to contribute to and participate in such an important conversation. I just want to express my uh, extreme gratitude for inviting me. Um, but in terms of Dan's work, uh, particularly, uh, Dan highlights how the multiple interpretations of the Moynihan Report have offered conflicting ways to deal with the growing crisis of the black family. The report has served as a means to justify government supports to improve the welfare of low-income black families and black men. It has also been encouragement to those who wish to ignore the precarious influence of race and the way it mediates the potential for upward mobility of these families. In general, the Moynihan Report has contributed to or inspired several areas of sociology, including, first, it extended from growing culture of poverty literature at the time, beginning with Oscar Lewis, who attempted to understand exactly how poverty, through what Moynihan would call the tango of pathology, reproduces itself and the means through which that happens. Lewis explains culture among the poor as a result of an adaptation to social, economic, and political conditions of poverty. In framing culture of poverty as an adaptation to one's material surroundings, we can understand the appeal to liberals that Dan mentions as his notion screams for government intervention to provide resources to improve the material conditions of the poor. However, some of the scholarship, including the Moynihan Report, tends to overemphasize the role that norms and values play in the way individuals in poverty make sense of the world. Specifically, in much work in this genre tends to presume an almost dysfunctional view of the world absorbed by children in poverty, which reduces their ability to take full advantage of opportunities for mobility as they become adults. Such a view assumes and lends itself to ideas that children and adults who grow or grew up in poverty don't espouse mainstream values, explaining its post-racial era appeal to conservatives, as Dan also highlights. And in the time since the Moynihan Report, much work has sought to and successfully challenged this idea. Another area that's also benefited from or challenged the Moynihan Report um, is issues related to the black community, so attempted to understand how the black community operates and the networks embedded in it. Most notably, Carol Stack in her seminal piece, All Our Kin, challenges the stereotype of black families as dysfunctional and self-destructive. Stack presents a complex network of real and fictive kin working together with few resources to survive, and so by fictive kin, she speaks how embedded in these communities are lots of symbolic familiar relationships where you know, everyone is someone's cousin, you know, folks have multiple mothers, uncles, things like that. And that among these networks exist complex rules about topics such as gifting and child rearing. And overall, she shows how a single parent household does not automatically equal social disorganization. Also, one of the most notable works complementing the Moynihan Report was that of William Julius Wilson and his seminal pieces, Declining Significance of Race and Truly Disadvantaged. 
Wilson reaffirms the class distinctions made by Monaghan and argues that structural forces like deindustrialization and spatial mismatch from employment significantly reduce the opportunities for mobility among the urban poor and particularly many black families and especially black men. He argues that men's growing isolation from work decreases their opportunities to be stable providers and the emasculation from not working causes their eventual exit from the home. And as Dan highlights, Wilson's work adds fuel to the ambiguous fire in that his idea of the declining significance of race appealed to conservatives and his focus on structural issues appeals to the public program inspired liberals. Overall, we see that the ambiguity of the report that Dan beautifully lays out in his work in many ways shaped the landscape through which later sociological work would be understood and to whom it would appeal either a value-driven, racially blind right or a structurally conscious public interventionist left. In regards to black men, which is my main topic of area or of interest where I focus on black men and absent fatherhood, another piece that was greatly influenced and extended from the Moynihan Report was that of Elliot LeBeau. In his famous text, Tally's Corner, published soon after the Moynihan Report, it attempts to address and investigate the black men that Moynihan sees as succumbing to a matriarchal culture. In the text, LeBeau seeks to elevate black men as a source of analysis and challenge the public perception of black men, as well as the culture of poverty suggested by Moynihan by capturing how the societal disenfranchisement of the men systematically leads to their decline in the workplace and in the home. In the seminal piece, LeBeau describes how men's presence on street corners is an outcome of the multiple sites of disenfranchisement in their day-to-day -day lives and not a desire to avoid work, as many thought at the time. Overall, all these works stemming from and responding to the Moynihan Report have been helpful, but another avenue of research that gets lost in the ambiguity of Moynihan's language is how do we understand absent fatherhood in and of itself. Moynihan links growing absence to growing unemployment and poverty, which steers discussions of absent fatherhood in a direction that encourages a solution specifically focused on putting men to work or alleviating their income poverty. Additionally, when talking about the tangle of pathology, Moynihan overlooks the possibility of the pathologic effects of absence itself where absence gets perpetuated through what I would call a tangle of absence that engulfs many across generations, as current trends today would suggest. In the years since the Moynihan Report, rates of absent fatherhood in the black community have nearly tripled and far exceed that of other racial groups. This trend in me necessitates a need to better grapple with and understand exactly what absent fatherhood is for the people who experience it. And specifically, insert budding grad student, uh, my work asks, how do men who grow up without fathers experience absence and make meaning of it, and what impact does their experience with absence have on their current or future fatherhood status? In my ongoing work, I've begun interviewing low-income black men in the Detroit area, many of which experience some type of absence from their fathers, to capture their life stories growing up into the present. And what I'm finding so far in my preliminary analysis exhibits how the pain and experience of not having a father around, both physically and emotionally, can shape how men interpret their own potential as fathers, their understandings of what it means to be a good father, and how they make sense of their own status in their children's lives. Additionally, embedded in the ambiguity of Moynihan's work isn't just a patriarchal assumption about the man's role in the home, but also a problematic assumption that full-time employment equates to fatherhood. In the preliminary work I've done so far, interviewing low-income fathers about their absent fathers, none correlated their father's absence to his employment status. Rather, they talked about the particular feelings stemming from the physical void left by their father in their lives, absent of his working status. And so, you know, by that I mean no man I've spoken with so far has suggested that if only my father had been employed, he would have been present, or suggests that they can specifically cite his unemployment to their absence in his life. And so overall, in revisiting the Moynihan Report, it is imperative that we also re-examine the assumptions that we make in terms of the presumed link between employment, present fatherhood, and the stability of the black family that in many ways remains in crisis 50 years later. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to turn it over for about 10 minutes. I think we'll let our panelists um, speak to each other. So, Dan, if you'd like to begin by responding. Yes, yeah, so just uh, thank you for those, um, you know, very interesting and uh, informative comments. Um, I'll just briefly uh, comment so that we can then uh, get to further discussion. But, uh, Tony, the, as far as affirmative action, um, you know, it makes total sense to me that this would emerge out of the racial liberalism of the early 1960s, um, you know, of which Moynihan was, was a part. Uh, it's remarkable that this period of the early 60s um, is a period when many uh, whites, even many white liberals, are fully confronting the weight of American racial history. Uh, Moynihan's a great example of that. I mean, Moynihan has no research background on African Americans, uh, you know, uh, prior to 
writing the Moynihan Report, basically. I mean, before 1963, he didn't think very much about African Americans, uh, and, you know, didn't think much as, about race as a problem. He did write this book, Beyond the Melting Pot, with Nathan Glazer, that sort of clued him into some of these issues, but um, uh, Glazer wrote the chapter in that book on, uh, on African Americans. So, uh, you know, this is a period when many white elites are, are beginning to confront this as an issue for the first time, I think. Um, and it's remarkable to, to remember this, and this is even long after the, the Brown decision. Now, when they do that, however, uh, there's a well-established tradition of, of what you and, and I would also call, it's a very awkward phrase, but racial liberalism, uh, you know, basically liberal views on race that emerge out of World War II, uh, that are associated, you know, perhaps most famously with Gunnar Myrdal's book, uh, An American uh, Dilemma, um, that really um, suggests that um, you know, the main problem facing uh, American society is how to uh, extend equal citizenship um, to African Americans, uh, but also has a number of assumptions. You know, he thinks African American culture is is a pathological variant of white culture. That those are his uh, terms. Uh, he thinks that uh, you know there, there was not going to be a big problem assimilating African Americans into American society. It doesn't require radical transformation. Doesn't require radical economic transformation. And Myrdal, many like him, including African American intellectuals that in some ways contribute to racial liberalism, although also having something different, people like E. Franklin Fraser and, and Kenneth Clark, um, you know, there's a well-established body there that's at least two decades old that Moynihan and I suppose your folks as well can turn to uh, in the early 60s when they start to, to pay attention. Um, now, uh, Matthew, I, I would just point out that you're exactly right that, uh, you know, Moynihan has begun this, this tradition that sort of equates, um, you know, male unemployment with absence, you know, that this, these, he sees as, as the same thing. Uh, you know, uh, I mentioned that Moynihan's most specific uh, policy suggestion in the report is military service. Well, African American joined the mil men joined the military not going to actually be around as fathers, right? I mean, um, so that's not what Moynihan, Moynihan um, isn't thinking about fathers actually being around. You know, he's thinking about more them setting, you know, uh, providing for the family, allowing the mothers then to do the work of uh, primary work of child rearing, and the fathers to be setting, I suppose, a positive role model, but they're not actually, they don't actually like to be around that much. And he's criticized by this by many, um, um, many of his critics actually point to this and say, look, your, your model of family is, is impoverished because your model is the man is just off at the office as a breadwinner. He's not actually part of the family. Um, the other thing there is that Moynihan had a very statistical understanding of African American families. I mean, basically he, he gathered the statistics. He was in the federal government, so he could gather a lot of statistics, but, you know, he didn't do, you know, I don't think he had ever met an African American family. He didn't. Um, he didn't do any ethnographic work. He just assumed, you know, oh my goodness, you know, 25% of families there's no man there. Well, this must be a female-fed-headed family, and the father must be absent, you know, just based on these statistics. And people like Carol Stack, you mentioned, uh, criticized Moynihan and said, look, to, if you really want to understand African American families, you need to do an ethnographic study. You need to go. You need to understand how people live. You need to understand the culture. You can't just infer it from from these statistics, um, you know, so I would just, um, you know, I suppose highlight those, those, those two points in my research that, that fit with, um, with what you were saying. All right, I'll use my moderator's privilege to ask a question. So um, I, I have two questions actually, and I'm not sure that either of them are particularly easy to answer. So one is, um, Dan, you closed with a, with a really, I mean, you give a very powerful critique um, of this document and the way that it has been continually used. So as a historian, I'm sort of picturing revisionists 30 years from now coming back and saying, oh, they threw out the Moynihan report. Is there anything at all? that we shouldn't disregard, I think is the first question. And the second question is, I mean, I'm very compelled by your argument for why this rhetoric is bankrupt for dealing with the issues that we need to deal with today. And so thinking about Matt's research, thinking about the research of many people in this room, what are the kinds of rhetorics that we can push to um, and that we can respond with when we have people like Nick Kristoff bringing up the Moynihan Report again and again? And that's for all of you, not just for Dan. Yes. Well, well, as to whether there's anything positive in the in the Moynihan report, I think I think there there uh, I think there is. I, I hope I suggested some of the positives. I mean, uh, this is not exactly appropriate, but Robert F. Kennedy had a great quote about Moynihan. He said, "Moynihan, it, he knows all the problems and is against all the solutions." Um, you know, so to some degree, Moynihan had his finger on on a very real issue. You know, at a pivotal time. I mean, I think he was right to say. 
you know, Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act are, are not enough. You know, we need to look at economic equality, and that's the, um, you know, he was absolutely right to do that. I think where, uh, where things got derailed, and possibly not necessarily through his own intentions, um, you know, I think he, it, to some degree at the time, he honestly thought by talking about family that maybe this would be a way to talk about this, this inequality. But in fact, uh, what he did was, uh, you know, got people to focus on family rather than on the other issues which are, which are more important. And I think that's probably the, um, you know, the lesson for today is that, um, uh, of course, people should research African-American families. They should talk about the, the, how Afri uh, families are related in a complicated way to, uh, to economic and social inequality. Um, but if you're only talking about families and you're not talking about other important things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, like taxes, like employment, you know, it seems like those are the places, uh, you know, to start. Uh, and to think that you, as William Julius Wilson and others think, you're going to start with family and to get people to care about those other things, I think is a very um, dangerous idea that 50 years has shown it doesn't work. So, um, you know, that, that's how I would respond. Um, I suppose to, to your questions, but I'd be interested to hear what the other panelists had to say. Um, well, prior to reading Dan's work, I'd never been so critical of the, the document itself in terms of a political statement. But, you know, for me, the Moynihan Report was also always a, a jumping off point, you know, such that to me, I don't believe the black family would have been of concern to many if Moynihan hadn't brought it to the foreground. And I think that the work that it inspired you know, has been very helpful to, you know, scholars like me trying to to write about it. I look at, I mentioned Elliot LeBeau's, you know, piece, you know, who himself, you know, used the report to say, hey, we haven't really talked about black men before. We focused on women and children. And the fact that this work could inspire scholars to do things like that, I think is, to me, where this document makes the most. Uh, I'll, I'll just jump in and say one of, the, I, one of the people I interviewed was a guy by the name of Robert Staples, who was one of, most, one of his most important critics and wrote a lot about the uh, African American family in the 60s and 70s. And he said to me, you know, he, he was a severe critic of the Moynihan Report, but he, said, he did say if Moynihan hadn't done this, you know, this, the, this whole field of research would not have come about. So he, he actually credited Moynihan in some way, even though he, he entirely disagreed with the report. I'm not sure I have anything to add, so. Okay. Um, are you guys ready? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Sorry for the technology, technological difficulties. My name is Marin Alemu. I'm a second year MPP student here at the Ford School of Public Policy with a particular interest in education policy. So this is a very, very important and relevant talk for me. So thank you all for being here. Um, first question for you. Um, are there policy writers who help us move beyond fixing families um, versus fixing economic structures? Could you repeat the question? Yeah, absolutely. Are there policy writers who help us move beyond fixing families versus fixing economic structures? Um, I'm thinking of the work here by uh, Catherine Eden. Uh, it's a book called uh, Being, the, Being the Best I Can. Or is it doing the best I can? Uh, doing the best I can. Doing the best I can. That recently came out where she looks at um, uh, um, low-income fathers or uh, in Camden, uh, New Jersey, many African American, but not all. Um, that's a book that I think uh, successfully looks at this issue. Some of the issues brought about by the Moynihan Report, but doesn't get caught in uh, the issue of trying to tie family structure to larger, um, you know, uh, inequalities. And she has some very interesting findings there that counter. Um, you know, what, uh, certainly what someone like Moynihan uh, thought, that she finds that, that many of these fathers are very involved in their children's lives, that they actually resent uh, the fact that um, they're meant to be the primary breadwinners. Many of them say, uh, they say, well, you know, you think of me as just a paycheck, is something that's, that many of them report to her, uh, and they view that negatively. And she suggests some interesting policy, policy solutions as well as in terms of giving these fathers rights, fatherhood rights, uh, you know, that the state treats them. 
solely in terms of um, provi you know, providing um, child support uh, payments and doesn't actually give them you know, the right to be with their children uh, for a certain amount of time. So there's some interesting suggestions there. So uh, I think in some ways, though, you know, when we're talking about uh, in the public way, you know, about families, uh, inevitably we'll be discussing so social policies, you know, uh, you know, if we're talking in the public arena, you know, the, it's a sort of question of what, what, is we, what can we as a society, um, you know, do to, um, uh, to help families out, um, you know, rather than say a private conversation. So I, th I think you can't, you can never leave that discussion behind when you're talking about families in the public arena. I actually thought of Eden, uh Right away, actually, and I, when I, what I think ties her most to the Moynihan report and her work is that, you know, if Moynihan is encouraging us to uh, help men become better providers, you know, she's, her work is challenging this idea that, you know, men are redefining their role as fathers, that they're not solely providers and they're finding alternative means to, to be fatherly, that's being more emotionally connected to their children, finding other ways to provide non-financial non ways, and I think in a way kind of undermines one has assumptions about this idea that fathers should be providers financially, whereas these men are finding alternative ways to be fathers in their children's lives. Uh, good evening. My name is DeMarla Lewis. I'm a first year MPP, um, and I'm interested in issues uh, relevant to economic justice, so looking at disparities within health, education, um, and uh, how those affect socioeconomic mobility. Um, and so, you know, thank you all for coming here today. And the first question uh, that I'm going to read for you um, is this. If the Moynihan Report was embraced by the right and the left, where did the war on drugs come from, as its thrust was to jail minority men? So effectively, uh, or I can repeat the question. Um, if the Moynihan Report was embraced by the right and the left, where did the war on drugs come from? as its thrust was to jail minority men? Well, I, think, I mean, I think the war on drugs was, was, it was in many ways bipartisan, although um, it's interesting I quoted uh, William Bennett. Uh, I mean, he was the Reagan's drug czar. If anyone's most responsible for the war on drugs, it's Bennett. And it's this tremendous um, disassociation for him to say, oh, well, these are problems that can't be solved by, by government cures. And here he is, and I would agree with the person who asked that question, you know, here he is locking up a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of men, uh, women as well, but mostly men. And so, you know, uh, men can't, they can't be good fathers or participants in their families if they're in jail. Um, you know, and that's, I think, one of the problems with the way that the, the debate is framed. Well, can government do something? Can it not do something? What it leaves out is, what is government doing that's actually hurting? You know, um, uh, and this, you know, the war on drugs, I think, would be one, one of the main things that, that um, you would have to say is, is uh, damaging families. Um, you know, I don't, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I could uh, put my finger on the fly on uh, where the war on, on drugs uh, came, uh, came from, but I do think that there's lots of really interesting work that um, can be consulted um, to, so that you begin to arrive at, at your own sense of where it came from, and so I would recommend uh, Naomi Murakawa's uh, latest book. I think it's called The First Civil Right. Veshla Weaver, uh, who is a, pol a political science professor at Yale, has also written a number of important articles, and I believe a book now uh, on the topic. Bruce Western um, uh, ha has, uh, has some work that kind of touches on, on the origins. And then Michael Tonry, the author of My Man Malign Neglect, uh, I think is a person you might consult as well uh, for, for some answers uh, that you could begin to put together for yourself. So. Thank you. Um, we have another question um, from the audience, and um, it is as follows. Um, didn't liberal, and it starts with a question. Um, didn't liberals blow it twice with Moynihan? In fact, because of the Moynihan report, they did not trust him when he got President Nixon pr to propose a guaranteed annual income in 1969. So they opposed the family assistance plan, which would have greatly increased welfare benefits in the South. Can you comment? Um, it's true, when, when Nixon, when Moynihan is in the Nixon administration, uh, he gets him to propose this family assistance plan. Now the reason why that plan fails is not because of opposition by liberals, it's because Nixon uh, backs away from it silently. Um, Nixon kills the plan, not, not liberals. It was opposed by uh, welfare rights activists because 
they were hoping for something better. Um, uh, in my view, they did, they did miscalculate, but it wouldn't have raised benefits in the outside of the South. Uh, would it, uh, you know, uh, at all. Um, the other thing about the family assistance plan is Moynihan, and Moynihan helps Nixon do this, they uh, frame it in very conservative terms. Um, uh, you know, they frame it in terms of, uh, even though it, it in fact is a guaranteed uh, income payment, they don't frame it in that way. You know, they frame it as a kind of uh, an anti-welfare measure uh, of many kinds. And, and um, you know, they use it to, uh, Sort of advance this view of uh, of the poor as uh, as as lazy, uh, and uh, you know this is a payment that's going to go to people who who really work. So they're they're crafting uh, the rhetoric that they're crafting, um, you know, is quite conservative, even as the the measure itself, you know, would have been you know would have been a small liberal advance. Uh -huh. Thank you. Next question from the audience. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights includes economic rights. The Moynihan Report seems to be a turning port to the, for the American right denying basic economic rights. How did the left go wrong? I'm going to repeat the question. Yeah, sure. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights includes economic rights. The Moynihan Report seems to be a turning point towards the American right in denying basic economic rights. How did the left go wrong? Well, for the right, I'm not sure it's a, I mean, the right would, would have always opposed economic rights, but there is a danger in the mid-1960s because of the growth of the, of the civil rights movement um, and uh, had really pushed on the agenda, um, you know, the in, racial inequality in all, to, in all of its aspects. So people like William Buckley are very worried that, um, you know, either Buckley's main concern, even though he, um, he did support Southern segregationists for, for a time, but he's not, he's mainly concerned about, you know, economic issues, but he's really worried that the, that the civil rights movement is gonna generate, um, you know, some, some form of, you know, a further form of, uh, of a liberal government or um, social democratic measures. Uh, and so he's, he actually, they, he uses, effectively uses the Moynihan Report to argue against this by saying this is, this is really a family um, issue. It's not, a, it's not about economics. Um, you know, I think, Moynihan and liberals went wrong, Moynihan in, in any case, and other liberals, some other liberals went wrong in how they conceived of economic inequality. I mean, it's a somewhat convoluted way. I mean, Moynihan thinks that economic inequality is mainly through, that there is fair competition in an open marketplace, uh, and the, the reason why African Americans aren't competing is because they're not well prepared. You know, so if they had better families, then they'd be better prepared, and then they could compete equally. Uh, but what he's overlooking is that the, the marketplace uh, is not open uh, and it's not a fair competition uh, and that, um, you know, the, there are other ways of going about rectifying these inequalities that would be more, more direct. Um, I would only add that, um, you know, to respond to the question, where did the left go wrong, part of the, part, the answer partly depends on what, what you mean by left and what you mean by go wrong. And, uh, and um, so one way to, th and you know, since the question I think is motivated by a concern about where, what happened to the economic focus in public policy, like, you know, and one way to answer the question might be to say, you know, whatever, whatever possibilities there might have been for a ro more robust involvement of the government in um, economic activity, uh, you know, may not have been eclipsed in uh, the mid-1960s because they had already been eclipsed uh, by the late 1940s, if you believe the line of historians like Nelson Lichtenstein and the argument that he makes about the social democratic possibilities in the Truman administration and how uh, some of the compromises and decisions by labor leaders like Walter Ruther led, uh, you know, the potential for some kind of corporatist arrangements, at least in the area of labor relations, to get to get kind of shunted aside. And if you believe the argument of Alan Brinkley, then the left went wrong in 1937, <laughs> uh, just at the end of uh, the second New Deal, uh, on the heels of a, a big recession and uh, Roosevelt's uh, error of commission with trying to pack the court and overreaching. And there was the moment, uh, according to Brinkley and his sympathizers, when uh, something very much more robust than what we eventually wound up with in the post-war period um, there was the moment when we lost it for good. So, uh, so part, part of the answer depends on what do you mean by left and part, what do you mean by went wrong, so. 
Um, another question that we have from the audience. A dominant narrative in American society right now centers on inequality. Race is on the outskirts of this conversation, but does not seem to be the focus of either major party. How can we shift the conversation on inequality to include race without repeating the mistakes of the Moynihan Report? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think um, let's make sure that the conversation, it, you know, doesn't get sidetracked into family as the, as the primary discussion. Uh, that would be, I suppose, my, uh, you know, my answer. Let's, um, you know, let, let's talk about the other things that are going on that are important. Um, you know, I was sort of, as things were developing last year and the, the protest movement in Ferguson was growing, you know, I was just waiting for people to, to refer to the Moynihan Report as a way to, to kind of take the discussion in another, in another direction. And it, you know, it did occur in, in some cases. So, I mean, that would be, um, you know, my worry about people like uh, Christoph and Will, you know, keeping up the Moynihan Report in, in this contemporary conversation uh, is that they're, they're sidetracking the discussion from where it needs to be. Well, I know in my own work, you know, on absent fatherhood, you know, I would love to and, and believe that absent fatherhood is, is not a, a black problem. Um, but for me, the focus on, on black men, particularly is the fact that, you know, one can't deny that statistically black men, black homes suffer more from this issue than, than other families and not to negate um, that it's problematic to all. But, you know, for me, my way of, of maintaining the, the racial um, aspect is to, is to note that, you know, this population more often than not suffers from this you know, issue. And so I maintain that by you know, focusing my research on this population, which often gets kind of like a negated for the larger issue. So we focus on absent father in general, but I don't want to ignore the fact that some people suffer from this more than others. No, I, just, I just add to that, that I don't think the Moynihan Report controversy shows this, that you can't, you can't actually discuss class inequality in the US without discussing race. Um, uh, that uh, these issues are, are intertwined, they need to be discussed at the same time. And I think the, the strategy of William Julius Wilson, which to some extent Obama has paid heed to, uh, you know, he had what he called a hidden agenda that uh, you're going, that, uh, you know, essentially you'd have programs would especially benefit um, uh, African Americans, but you would present it in, in class terms because racial terms are so divisive. Uh, but I think that's very, well, first of all, to call something a hidden agenda is somewhat self-defeating. Um, but secondly, you know, to, to think that that's uh, uh, effective is, is problematic because race will always uh, enter, enter the conversation uh, in the U.S. So it needs to be, it needs to be addressed openly. Uh, I don't think you can see things as, as a solely a racial issue. There's a the class component to it as well, but these are overlapping. They, they can, neither, neither part of that can, be, can ever be forgotten. Next question from the audience. Um, what are your opinions on HR 40, Congressman Conyers' proposal to study reparations? Yeah. I mean, it's something that personally I, um, you know, I would uh, uh, favor. I mean, reparations certainly would be a more um, direct way of uh, addressing some of the, um, you know, the inequalities that are present in American history. I mean, reparations were paid to um, Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II. Uh, you know, so why shouldn't they be paid to uh, the descendants of slaves and people who suffered from, uh, um, you know, racial discrimination that has directly affected wealth creation today? Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, politically, it's, uh, it's obviously not a, uh, it's a non-starter politically. So, you know, we should, we should recognize that it, it's, uh, you know, a good idea in theory, but uh, one that perhaps not too much attention should be invested in because it's not one that's likely to, uh, to prevail. Uh. Um, I, do, I do believe that more work should be done to, to better understand and tie the issues that, that plague black communities to slavery. Um, and some work I've done, you know, one can kind of locate um, a kind of a systematic removal of, of men from the home as early as the plantation. Um, that in many cases, men were, were removed and power was instilled in the slave owner. Um, and that is something that though we can't particularly trace historically to the present, I think it is something that needs more research to better show um, the need for something like a reparation. Um, Uh, next question from the audience is uh, for you, Matt. Um, 
And it's for you because uh, you mentioned that the, um, since the Moynihan report has been issued, that the rates of single mother families have tripled in the black community. And the question is to ask if you are aware of how it has, um, it, how it's influenced the, or impacted the white community um, during the same time, time span. So how has the Moynihan report um, you know, influenced the single mother families like, what is the rate of single mother families in the white community, it do, and how does that compare to the black community since the uh, Moynihan report was issued? Um, and was that, uh, and what does that do to? Okay, um, so that was like three questions in. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so, you know, first, no, one can't deny that absent fatherhood or, um, you know, the growing um, rate of single parent households has increased across the board. Um, so that in no way negates that it's not a general issue, and lots of research has shown that, you know, in general, the way we think about, you know, what a, a nuclear family is, you know, has changed. Um, that it's okay now for a mother to be a single mother, and, and that doesn't have the same stigma it did years ago, and that um, those things are changing across the board. So I, I don't think that um, it's just a black, in, a black issue, and I, I think in some cases for whites it has increased over like 20% since the Moynihan era. Um, but again, that rate compared to the way the blacks increased was just not as significant. Um, and what was the second? And what was, uh, what was that increase due to? For due the, to? Yes. Uh, that I'm not sure, but I mean like at, at least in the black community from what I've studied, I mean one can trace it to issues around unemployment, issues around crime, um, adverse policies like child support enforcement that uh, for men who did want to support their children could be jailed or in some way uh, punished for not paying these supports. Um, so lots of issues, I think, over time have definitely influenced the removal of the black man from the home. Next question from the audience. How can you begin to reconcile um, the Moynihan's report's importance of families with the strong current emphasis on the importance of families in K through 12 educational success and achievement? I mean, I'm not an expert on, um, you know, on current research. Um, I do think there are questions about, um, you know, I suppose what the what the independent variables are there. I mean, because, um, you know, two parent families also tend to uh, co correlate with uh, more affluent families. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure of the exact research that's uh, uh, that's fitting there. I mean, I think it's. Um, it's a very good thing for a child to have, you know, a, a loving, involved family. There's no, there's no question about that. Um, that doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, two parents in the way that Moynihan thought. Uh, you, know, you need to take a closer look at what the individual families are, um, you know. But uh, I would certainly agree with that. I had to take a closer look at the research, but I don't know that you can narrow, you can easily, you know, if, if you were just to go research and say two parent families versus you know, one parent families, of course you would find the kids from two parent families doing better, but it, is it because um, they have two parents or is it because uh, of other factors that correlate with that? I think it's a very tricky thing to, to tease out. And I personally am not convinced that the two parent family thing is the central factor that's being put forward by, by many as. Uh, here's another question from the audience, and this is for you, Dan. Um, in your experience, what is the difference in perspective on U.S. civil rights, or the Moynihan Report more specifically, in Ireland versus the United States? Hmm. Well, that's a very interesting uh, question. I mean, the um, um, of course, the, uh, there's strong support for, uh, for you know, uh, U.S. civil rights movement in Ireland. There was at the time, and there's still strong memories of that. I mean, it was co correlated at the time with the struggle for Catholic rights in Northern Ireland, which um, for a time had a movement that called itself the Civil Rights Movement after the U.S. and adopted much of the iconography. Um, I don't think the Moynihan Report is much known there. Uh, it's interesting to think, though, about Moynihan's Irishness as connecting to the report, because it did connect to the report. Moynihan thought that, and actually he was from a, a family where the father had abandoned the family when he was a, a young boy. Uh, and Moynihan thought because he was Irish and the Irish had been discriminated against and because he didn't have a father that he really understood uh, African-American families, he drew that analogy. 
on the one hand, it did lead him to be, I think, more empathetic, but on the other hand, it, I think it led him to kind of confuse what his situation was with, with the situation of African Americans in, in, the, in the 1960s. I don't think their situations were actually as parallel as he, as he drew them. Uh, and he, he made that parallel often, even in a Time, Time Magazine interview, he said, uh, he said, quote, uh, Patty is just like Sambo, uh, using the, you know, using the, the uh, slurs for both Irish and, and, uh, and African Americans. So you know, he, he often made that point and drew on his Irishness to say, because I'm an ethnic American, I understand what it's like to be, uh, you know, to be an African American. Next question from the audience. Since the publication of the Moynihan Report and Bill Wilson's The Truly Disadvantaged, there appears to have been a movement away from the least, at least within sociology, studying the structure of black families as it relates to poverty and inequality. How can scholars better or more effectively study the black family on its own terms without falling into the same traps of racism, classism, and sexism? <laughs> Um, yeah, very good question. Uh, difficult question. Yeah. I mean, you know, and uh, again, I'm, I'm a historian, not a sociologist. I mean, I do think the Eden book is, is a really great uh, example of, uh, and I think uh, Matthew's work suggests some of the ways that we can be, uh, you know, getting around this. I mean, we shouldn't, um, you know, there shouldn't be, um, you know, just because I think there, there are pro political problems with the Moynihan Report doesn't mean people should stop researching, you know, uh, African American families or, or indeed all families. Um, you know, that research should, should continue. I'm not sure that I agree that it's necessarily um, slowed down since the Moynihan Report. I mean, the, often the, and this is something Wilson repeats, but people say, well, after the Moynihan Report, you know, he was so attacked that people didn't study the African American family for so long. And that's just, it's just demonstrably false. I mean, if, if, in fact, as we were discussing before, the opposite is the case. There's a tremendous explosion of research of African-American families, much of it anti-Moynihan, um, you know, but it, it's still the research is being done uh, um, uh, for, uh, throughout the 60s and, and 70s and into the 80s. And I think that that research continues in, in many veins, but I think the, you know, personally, I would think people who are doing work that is looking at structural issues, looking at statistics, but also uh, has a very strong ethnographic component, uh, you know, I would find the most, the most compelling. I've been strongly resisting trying to rip your microphone away, but now, um, just to sort of piggyback on that, Matt, if you, would you talk a little bit about your methodology and your approach? Because I think that that offers maybe one way for us to see, um, to see an, a very particular answer to this question. Yeah, I think that, you know, and I agree that, you know, much work has, you know, been done since truly disadvantage in that. I think an important, you know, way that I like to approach my work and that I think differs sometimes is that I'm, I'm less concerned with, um, you know, why black folks, or in this case, you know, black men aren't meeting a particular standard. You know, I'm more interested in, you know, how does this phenomenon work? So for my case, it's how does absent fatherhood work? And I'm less concerned with asking, you know, how can black men be more like, you know, present middle class white men? And I think that's an, a way or approach that, you know, new work has taken, such as Kath Eden's work, and I'm thinking of, of folks that have been here, like David Harding, where it's understanding better how the, uh, the environment, um, you know, different environmental factors, structures, uh, influence or plague these families and keep them from meeting standards versus just asking why they're not meeting it. Better understanding from their context why and how and how they feel about these phenomena, how it impacts the way they make meaning of the world, of themselves, and how that can not just affect them but also impact future generations to come. What hasn't been done for me in absent, with studies of, studies of absent fatherhood is that normally we kind of focus on it as just like an attribute in one's life. Uh, for me, it's more of a focus of how does this happen to carry over for so many generations such that it has tripled since the Monet Report. So that's the way that I tackle it. Um, if you could recommend any research from African American scholars uh, that have done work on studying the black family post the Moynihan Report, what would you suggest? Who would you reference? Well, I mean, if we're looking immediately after the, after the report, I mentioned Robert Staples before. The other person I mentioned is a woman named, by the name of Joyce Ladner, um, who, um, along with uh, Carol Stack, uh, was the first to re uh, do research that was focused on the experience of African American women. Uh, there's a book uh, called uh, Tomorrow's Tomorrow, a uh, very interesting book that um, in some ways holds up, holds up quite well. 
Uh, interesting thing about Ladner is that she was at Washington University uh, in St. Louis. Her advisor was a guy by the name of Lee Rainwater, and Rainwater was Moynihan's biggest defender. He actually wrote the first book on the Moynihan Report called um, uh, The Politics of Controversy uh, with one of his graduate students. And so Rainwater is one of Moynihan's biggest supporters, and he did this big um, ethnographic study of uh, pruitt Igo, a sort of notorious um, uh, public housing uh, estate in uh, St. Louis. Um, and, uh, and his student, Joyce Ladner, then comes to completely different conclusions than, uh, than Rainwater had. And Rainwater was very pro Moynihan and used the used research to, to, to back Moynihan, whereas Ladner was on the totally opposite side of things. But uh, I think she did some very interesting work in the, in the 1970s that, in, in some ways, um, um, still holds up. Um, well, I'd first give a shout out to my advisor, who I think is here, Al Young, uh, whose work. Um, um, I think greatly um, contributes to the cultural sociality that we've seen around understanding better how certain so, uh, environmental factors, for him, it's social proximity. Um, but also I'm thinking of uh, more recent stuff like uh, keeping it real, um, understanding better how uh, kind of a, the, a, another challenge to kind of like this oppositional culture idea that, you know, kids don't do well in school because they don't want to act white. Um, so that's a text I think greatly gets at how like kind of schools um, devalue and or don't uh, don't allow children to use their uh, kind of their own influences to develop themselves in school. Um, those are the two most that stand out to me that have been done. And uh, last question, as I understand, we're running short on time. Um, so we've talked a lot about um, what work can be done from a scholarly perspective, but you know we're here in the policy school. And so you have people who are going to be going out into the policy world making decisions on programs and policies. And so given what we've talked about today, uh, what is one piece of advice that you would give to them and to those who are going to be making decisions on programs and policies pertaining to social welfare? Uh, well, again, a very good and a tough question. I mean, I think um, with our discussion about, I mean, uh, you know, one of the first things would be to look at the, at the situation with incarceration in prisons. I mean, I think, you know, sort of first, first do no harm, um, you know, uh, um, and I think the, you know, sort of perverse the way the conservatives have proffered this idea that it's sort of welfare policies that have, you know, that has government's been doing harm rather than, than things like, uh, you know, uh, mass incarceration. Um, uh, on the on the other hand, I think you know we should we should still look at, at some of the things that were connected to the Moynihan report. I mean that would would strengthen uh, not just families but uh, you know all, all individuals. I mean uh, things like employment, um, you know uh, uh, higher wages, uh, increased uh, unionization. Um, also policies that I think it's problematic to look at policies that. Uh, are directed only at, at men. I mean I, William Joyce Wilson does this too. I mean he makes a. I'm, I'm eligible male, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, he has a statistic of marriageable males among African Americans, and it's based on their employability. Uh, but you know, another uh, policy approach that many critics of Moynihan said at the time, and is still relevant, is well, if you don't have, you know, two parent families, uh, then it's a real problem, you know, that uh, if uh, in most cases, you know, the, the the main provider is a woman, it's a real problem that women aren't paid enough as men. Um, you know, it's a real problem that they're not getting support, extra support for the government for single parent families. So if you if you really want to provide, you know, for children, maybe look at making those families that are there more viable, you know, rather than to, to trying to recreate some kind of uh, ideal, uh, you know, two parent family. So that that would be another thing I would suggest. Uh, one thing I might say is. Um you know, as, as you march out into the real world from policy school and try to think about, you know, um, what to do with the, what you've learned here is, is I think it's important to bear in mind, like, um, you know, or, or to be mindful of the quality of the evidence that people are basing their claims on. Uh, and, you know, and then, and, you know, to develop a taste for different kinds of evidence yourself uh, as you take classes in policy school and begin to form some opinions about what is credible evidence, what is not credible evidence, when do I believe something, when do I not believe something. Because I think that having that sensibility, that'll be a compass for you as you navigate the pretty turbulent real world when people are making lots of conflicting claims uh, and citing evidence to try to back their point up and having a feel yourself for what credible evidence is, I think is a, uh, 
you know, uh, it's like a good skill to have and will serve you well. And the returns on that are very high over the course of a career. So that's what I would say. Um, as a former MPP student uh, who went into the real world and came back, um, <laughs> you know, I, I like to remind people, and, and I, I truly believe that I think it's important to remember that you're a person before you're a policymaker. Um, I think that you know we all have the capacity to contribute with our own biases and and kind of like world experiences and like you know you mentioned with Moynihan himself coming from an absent father home and all the ways in which he tried to assume a, an identification with. Um, black families, he still in a lot of ways got it wrong. Um, and to remember, I think, be, you know, heighten our awareness that, you know, outside of like thinking we have the answer, we also contribute to the problem in some ways. And I think constantly being aware of the ways in which we as people um, can stymie policy is important to be aware of along the way. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to thank our speakers and our uh, moderators and the good questions that came from uh, the audience. And we're, uh, we want to welcome you to a reception outside um, in, the, in the Grand Hall.